Hi, my name is Jack Bookie Jans. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair, and welcome to the CAIF Exhibitions Talk um, as part of CAIF Presents August 2021. Um, we're focusing this session on the exhibitions that are on the walls at the moment in Cairns in August. Uh, you guys watching this won't be seeing this until November, which will be part of uh, CAIF, um, the digital online art fair on 2021.kf.com.au and I'm joined here today by three very special ladies who are cultural practitioners, cultural leaders uh, and uh, visionaries in the arts who have brought, come together um, presenting numerous uh, exhibitions which uh, form part of the CAIF program this year. Um, we're joined by Francois Lane um, who is the curator of the Where's Your Permit exhibition, which is where we are at the moment, uh, at the Tanks Art Centre. We're joined by Ashley Campbell, who is the director of Northside Contemporary Arts, uh, and Bobby Rubin, um, who is the curator of the um, Indigenous Textiles uh, from the Tropic Zone exhibition at um, the Cairns Courthouse Gallery, which is the new one. So thank you for joining us, ladies. Um, so I thought let's start um, very quickly with uh, just some basic introductions. So I might start with Francois and we might move this way. I am a, well, I, I'm many things as women can be, but as a professional I'm a qualified interior designer uh, and I operate a practice with my husband, an architecture and design practice, um, which is the only 100% Indigenous owned architecture practice in Australia. Um, and we've been operating for about 11 years. As a creative practitioner, I've always had that in my blood. It's always been there. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to practice um, in design. And in more recent years, I've um, gotten back to my first love, which is creating art and also creating um, uh, print for textiles, which I really love doing. So um, I've been really blessed to have the opportunity to um, co-curate the Where's Your Permit exhibition. Um, curation is a natural fit for what I do. Um, I've started to describe my work as that intersection between arts and design that, that seems to describe, um, you know, my practice. Thank you. And now Ashley? Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, so my name's Ashley Campbell, I'm the director of Northsight Contemporary Arts, which was formerly Kick Arts. Um, I was born in Toowoomba, which is Jarawea country, up on the Great Dividing Range. Um, and I've been living in the north for the last five years. Uh, a job at the Cairns Art Gallery's curator brought me here. And I feel very fortunate um, to be in this place and learning from so many uh, wonderful artists and people that we work with. Um, my heritage is British Irish. And um, yeah, it's, it's been um, a beautiful year this year. My um, son came into the world, so I've spent uh, the last six months um, journeying around Queensland, meeting his family uh, from the Torres Strait, Sunshine Coast, and over Normanton and uh, around Mount Isa. So I feel very fortunate to be here today. Thank you. Um, likewise, thank you so much for inviting me to partake in this. Um, so Bobby Rubin, um, I've been living in Cairns for about 11 years, before that Darwin for about 25 years. Um, born in Daniloquin, New South Wales, I believe that's Wiradjuri country, I think. Um, and I've been working with the um, screen printed textiles um, with artists from remote communities for about 20 years and I came to that um, through a visual arts degree with a printmaking background in Darwin and yeah, been doing it ever since. So, hmm. thank you. Well, thank you and it's, it's great to have uh, you guys here and of course um, we're going to get into a little bit of the, uh, to talk about the exhibitions that uh, you've all been involved in uh, presenting for CAIF this year. Um, but I want to really focus on uh, we're in a very, we've got interesting company because we've got artists and creative people uh, in terms of producing works themselves who are also now finding themselves in a, 
a curatorial space and as um, Francois you said with your background in uh, design as well it's a natural way to obviously when you're making something uh, you do have a, a, a sort of a foresight as to how it might uh, be presented visually um, I'm wondering it has it always been has cura curation always been on the top of your minds perhaps even with you actually as a um, I would imagine that a, a gallery director is very administrative uh, policy, arts policy. Um, have you ever dabbled in, in curating or, or stepped in at, while you've been at Northside? Um, thanks, Jack. So I went to art school and um, was far more interested in what everyone around me was doing um, and interested in the theory and talking to people and why they make the work that they do. Um, I think I have a particular set of skills that lend themselves to um, running a gallery. And so it's been wonderful to be at Northside and building a team. And um, last year we presented some exhibitions as well and had the great um, pleasure of working with the Billy Missy Estate um, and curator Russell Millage. Um, and I guess all of these exhibitions were always team efforts. And um, I was working as curator at the Cairns Art Gallery and I think I, we're approaching things differently at Northside as we build a team. And today I really wanted David Noah, Noah Jr, our curator, to be here talking to the exhibitions and um, Dennis Hunter from Jabakai Aboriginal Corporation because I think it's really important um, to share skills and come together to um, look at the best way to present exhibitions. And so I think my role is really meeting with artists, hearing their aspirations and then finding ways to realise the shows. Um, but making sure that as curators, um, when we do have uh, the pleasure of playing that role, we're not telling the story for the artists. So I think at Northsight we're really pointing to the artists and raising the artists um, and the community's voice. And so the current exhibitions that we've got on at the moment, uh, Beralene Gatha from Mornington Island Arts Centre and John Armstrong have um, worked with those 12 artists to really tell these beautiful um, stories about country and paying homage to um, Sally Gabor and Gubathald and Dick Rossi, their late elder um, Lardel and Cadult artists. Um, and every exhibition that we've got on at the moment has been approached in a different way. So I worked closely with Francois and that was a conversation over the last two years <laughs> um, about a wonderful um, piece of work that she did with a Scottish uh, artist and designer, Emily Millichim. Um, the Jabakai story, for example, uh, they're at the start of a, another really exciting time for Jabakai people uh, establishing the Art Centre. So hopefully um, when Kaif audiences come up in November and years ahead, we'll be able to head up to Coranda and see what they're doing. So that exhibition was really driven by the people and telling the story um, from the Mawadi system. Um, so yesterday, Dennis was recording some words so class audiences can hear exactly, you know, what they're sharing through that work. And um, the other show that we've got on at the moment is um, by Uncle Tommy Powell. And he, um, again, a conversation over a couple of years, really wanted to look at the story of the coming of the light and being 150th anniversary um, this year. He's, um, it's his take on Torres Strait history. Um, over that 150 years. So, yes, I dabble in curation, but it's really lovely to work with artists and approach exhibitions in different ways and find the resources that they need to tell those stories. And it's a, it's a really good point uh, that you made. I mean, was it a big leap going from uh, being a curator and then being in charge of, the, of a very, you know, comprehensive uh, art institution? And... Um, you miss it, obviously, and it's always in your blood. But how do you find, um, you, and I do want to touch on the way that Northside um, does approach um, cu cultural works uh, by Indigenous artists and, and, and the uh, presentation of those works in your space. But firstly, how do you source curators? And in uh, a, a region like tropical North Queensland, how, um, how important is cur curation to uh, the function of a gallery, to the, the, the role that they play with artists when they're coming in and presenting their works to your gallery? And uh, career development for curators, how do you identify a curator? What was it, I guess, with you that, that made you in your earlier life go, oh, that's, that's something I wanted to do as opposed to move away from perhaps creating works yourself? 
I think I've been um, privileged in my young career to be given opportunities and I've had some great female mentors and um, at a young age I did an internship with the Biennale of Sydney and got a little path there and was working with some fantastic international artists bringing works out um, to Australia and putting them around Sydney. And then when I moved to Cairns, I think I was fortunate to um, be given that opportunity. So I think now that I'm in a position where I can um, shape and craft an organisation, it's really important that um, the right people are there helping artists to tell their stories. So last year when we had few staff and lots of change and, you know, a new building and it was just change upon change for the organisation, um, we waited and worked with artists on those exhibitions um, or external curators and myself. Um, and then this year we we're fortunate um, to have Ava Noah Jr. moving to Cairns. Um, he spent 14 years at Gap Tatui and I think um, you know, he's got a wonderful set of skills and it's really important to have these people here because the flow on effects for all the other young and you know, senior creatives to be able to have the safe space to explore their ideas and tell their stories and share them. You can't always do that with someone that doesn't have that lived experience. So hopefully through having um, a really diverse and dynamic team and our teams, um, you know, different on um, individual projects, we can keep opening the doors and have a really good succession plan for artists in, and curators in the North in future years. Thank you, and, and, with, and Bobby, with your involvement with um, your show at the Courthouse Gallery, um, perhaps a little origin story of, of that, um, that collection of works and uh, how you came to become involved um, in that particular show. Um, thanks, good question. Um, how did I get to be um, so involved? But um, curating isn't really my background. I'm sort of more a on the ground worker and um, you know, I go out and work with artists when I'm invited to do so. And I work really at the development stage with the um, creation of the textiles. So just working closely with artists and the design process. You know, the artists come from um, a background of their art practice and I bring in that design element so we can work within the constraints of this medium. And, you know, there are a lot of constraints to make um, you know, a work of art into a design that's going to work on a screen and it's going to print continuously. And I guess the three um, major things that I work with artists on are um, the, I mean, the three things that make the textiles medium more difficult than other mediums are the, um, the colour separation, um, which isn't intuitive for most of us. Um, the, the fact that it's a re image repetition, you know, you're, you're um, repeating it infinitely. You know, I mean, in the gallery there, we've got six metre lengths and we've had eight metre lengths here. Um, and the fact that you've got to join up the edges, it's got to go continuously, you can't see where it begins and ends. So that's kind of where I, I come from. Um, and I was probably approached by the gallery about a year ago. Um, I know they wanted to have, you know, bring together textiles from the top end for quite a while. So um, we pretty much worked from west to east and, um, you know, 10 art textile producing art centres were all really interested in being a part of it. So um, that's, that's how it all came together. And we were quite a big team, you know, working for the year and then to hang the exhibition. I think there were five of us for five days, up scissor lifts and um, so, it, yeah, it didn't happen easily, but I'm glad it happened, so thank you. And um, Francois, you, I want to know how, where's your came, uh, came, how it came about, because of course I work with Kaif, but I've just realised it's actually a story um, that I've not asked before and that I'm not aware of and how, um, because it, it's, it seems to be a concept that's so fitting for what's happening uh, in this day and age. So was that, was that, did that come before or after I suppose and how did, uh, how did you become involved in the exhibition? Uh, I had considered the time in which we lived um, as an artist and that um, we were living under these, you know, restrictions on movement. 
I had spent time on an artist sabbatical on my family's country in the Torres Strait on Kruri. And as I uh, have had a number of sabbaticals up there, um, just connecting to country, just, you know, quietening and being still in that on country. I walk around that land and it's a land that my mum um, was born into and was a was a child growing up there with her ten other siblings and it was a very hard time. They lived under the Act um, and they they survived off that land. Um, as I walked around that country, I contemplated what I knew, the history of that land. Um, I don't have permission to speak about it, so I can't speak about it yet. But there's a lot to process um, in the way of disconnect of culture. Um, and um, just processing that my, my grandparents survived. They, they worked the landscape, they worked the hill to create terrace gardens. And I just considered, surely, look, I need to tell this story. I, I wanted to create art that drew from the resources of that land, so I used, I extracted dyes in the same way that my grandfather did. And I used a charcoal that was taken from land management when my cousins burned through the land while I was there. Um, and I used charcoal and um, natural dyes, um, and then I put my my paper in preparation into the earth so that it would have the staining from rain. So it was a two-week period that I just let it seep um, while I produced. And there was healing in that because um, as I was doing this, it's like I'm physically connecting with the land, I'm physically connecting with the way that my grandfather, my ate, extracted those dyes. He'd use it for timber, I'm using it on paper. And I started to think about and celebrate their ingenuity during that time, how they survived with the produce of that land because they, they were paid a pittance for the work that they did. And my ate was a skilled carpenter. Um, and I thought, I need to celebrate this. I have to find really good stuff about our family um, because there is um, inherited trauma through the family, extended family. And I thought, you know, this is what I want to think about. I knew that others would re relate to this, especially during the time where we're living with restrictions. That was just one common element that the wider Australian nation could relate to is not being able to go where we want to go. We don't have that freedom to move about because it's in order to protect the greater good. So what happens when it's not for the greater good? It's a good place to start conversations, I think. Um, I met with Janina um, post Kaya and um, we just had a chat about it and it resonated with um, thoughts that Janina had been having also about how we can use this time. There's something really significant about this time that we can actually use to educate others. Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, we started talking and we started kind of, you know, how do you come up for a title to capture this? Like, <laughs> there was lots of talking and we had to laugh because if you don't laugh, you cry. So we found a lot of things to have a good laugh about, um, but equally we've cried a lot too. Um, so that was how it came about. And then it's just that rolling process of, okay, how do we, how do we group this together, get a brief out, you know, um, so that it, it gives opportunity for, for artists to respond to that, to that thing. Thank you, yeah, it's a good story. And one of the things I, I um, and you'll have known, and now we sit here in the fruits of, 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 all, of, of all of that hard work is how um, receptive um, our artistic director, Janina Harding, 
is uh, when it comes to unearthing new, new new styles, new concepts, important messages that need to be told. And um, uh, you know, I think that that's great. We've got the the right woman in the job. And um, I want to talk also about. Um, that newness, the fact that the uh, this exhibition, Where's Your Permit, is one that um, has an overarching and over-encapsulating theme and message that permeates all the works, all the artists, all of society and the world at the moment. There's a lot of new things. So this exhibition has got a great deal of new uh, mediums and new styles for some of the, especially artists who have a very distinct style, like Alec Tapodi, for example, I think, um, at the opening of the exhibition, that was one of the things that had been com people going, is that Alec? That's an Alec? And um, with uh, the Northside exhibitions, there's not only a new, would I be correct, Jabagai Art Centre, it's, it's a new kid on the block in terms of its organisation and that it's got a, a future uh, that it's planning as an active art centre. You've got Francois, you've got an exhibition on at Northside as well, which is uh, completely uh, new, I guess, uh, mode of creativity for that we've seen, especially from the contemporary indigenous art uh, space up in the north as well. So that's a new style of work that's being produced, which are backpacks. And um, then, of course, with the uh, textiles, I really want to also talk about the textiles and the future of that, because that's something that um, Bobby and Francois are linked in, in, in some of their work. But uh, back to uh, with Northside, it's new, newly rebranded. As you said, you've had a lot of changes and probably still some to come. Uh, how important is it to show both the, the sort of the new direction that Francois and artists is going into, the, the new works that are being unearthed and, you know, from this sort of home region, from the Jabagai Art Centre, and also at the same time having a sort of a, a look back to the past with what um, Tommy's works are. And then, of course, with the Mornington Island works, which, um, um, you know, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of uh, a, a standard, um, beautiful pieces, massive pieces as well. But the exhibition there is not standard as well. It's, it's quite darkly lit, and, and some of the works have been turned uh, and presented in a really unusual and distinctive way. So tell us about all the newness going on at Northside. There's so much. Newness, yes, but um, I think um, there's a lot of um, legacy and, um, you know, with change we have to be um, careful of honouring the past and I think with the Jabakai show, for example, it, yes, it's about Jabakai now and um, they're going through an exciting time. Um, the, the title of the exhibition is Bularu uh, Dado Nungu. <laughs> um, Dennis says it much more eloquently than I do in Jabagandi. Um, but it means the spirit is strong, the people are strong, um, and the country is strong. And so there's um, a very, very, very long history of, um, you know, there's cultural artifacts in that space. And then it's recognising that there's a strong weaving history and painting history in that region. But they've chosen to look at this particular statement in a conceptual way. Um, and choreographing the dancers um, to, you know, look at body markings and really um, cleansing that new art centre, that space up on the hill, which is a new chapter. And I think um, for Northside generally, it's um, we're coming up to our 30-year anniversary as an organisation next year. So it's a great time to look back at the past and bring together all of... Um, the creatives and the history and this beautiful cross-cultural collaboration that's always happened in the North. Um, so yes, there's a lot of new, but I think um, it's grounded in a rich history that we all recognise and um, respect. Um, and just with Francois's exhibition, um, you know, there's been patience and it was uh, a wonderful collaboration, a new opportunity, I suppose, for Francois working uh, internationally with Emily Millichip from 2016 um, and so they're new forms and um, a, a special one-off collaboration but not particularly you know a, a whole new direction for either of those artists but I think that's the thing when artists and creatives come together for the first time um, and you know you must see that in the textile work that you do across centres there's sparks and, and that's, that's exciting um, to be given the opportunity, just like the artists in this exhibition. I was blown away last night, giving 
um, space to say and create works that perhaps aren't in the type of work that they always do create um, and sharing really personal stories. So thank you for that. Which way are we going? Uh, well, yeah, to Bobby, but um, Bobby, I want to really uh, talk about, um, you know, textiles is, um, from what I've been able to notice, that's only in the last few years that it's really been uh, exhibitions dedicated to textiles. I remember back, God, it was a while back, going into the National Gallery of Australia and seeing some of, well, yes, yeah, some of the Thankupi, um textiles and panels, that, and there were two or three. I think there's some by um, Destiny Deacon as well um, that I met, remember seeing, but it was, there weren't many panels, they weren't, they weren't prominently displayed. They were there, obviously, but they weren't given too much space because I suppose no one was really making them in, in that, uh, with that um, uh, vigor, I guess. But now we've got exhibitions. Kaif last year, one of the uh, award-winning uh, installations by Clinton Nain, it was um, textiles. Uh, textiles are now, I think, in the collections even at Northside and it's been presented everywhere. It's a new, it's not new, but it is getting definitely more popular. And you were saying earlier about the, uh, it, the design is infinitely being run through a press. How, how, how does that happen as a, as a textile uh, artist yourself? How do you take a, how do you envisage an artwork that you've created on such a scale, um, and in, especially if those, especially with a new medium being on a textile um, panel, fabric panel, how did, were some of the artworks uh, and designs that feature in your show from those artists, were they perhaps uh, printed or created on other mediums historically? And how did they, if that's the case, how did they go transitioning into um, textiles and prints? Wow. So, um, well, I, I like your um, question about newness. And um, I mean, I'll first, first of all, I'll go back that the textiles really began in the, in the late 60s on the Tiwi Islands and really bubbled along and were very successful. There were international um, exhibitions and um, and that I think, what are we talking, around 15, 20 years, they grew a certain amount and then they really sort of petered or, or paired back. And I think um, a lot of artists moved away from textiles to works on canvas and paper and, um, textiles is a very hard medium and it doesn't bring in, um, you know, the, the financial returns that work, other works. I mean, it, it, the funny thing is it does, but it's a long term, you know, it's a small amount, but hopefully artists will be getting money for themselves and their, their families, um, you know, in, in many years to come. and. Um, you know, the textiles outlive the artists. I mean, there's textiles from William Morris in the UK that were um, designed 150 years ago that are hugely popular now, and Marameco in Finland. So, you know, they can have a, lo a longevity, which if you manage them well, that will bring returns to communities. So that's what we kind of aim for. But, um, so what was your other question? <laughs> Yeah, and look, that everyone is different, um, and and it comes back to looking at the the principles of design. And because I've looked, I looked a lot at, at design theory myself. And the thing with design is, is you you often don't know what you're going to get until you get there, and it's a long process of problem solving and um, trying out, going down different paths then coming back and you know because you're looking for that successful design that's going to um, be enduring because they're um, they're a lot of work to create they're expensive to set up so you know you want to make sure that design is going to go somewhere so um, for some works it'll be quite similar to the artists other works and other material uh, and other media and other times it will be a whole new form that at the end of it we all think wow we didn't know that was going to turn out like that. And that, that's part of the joy of this work, and for artists and for myself, that you, know, you don't know what you're going to get until you get there. Um, so we have lots of, lots of wonderful new forms, and, you know, and I love the works that are um, not just about sort of 
you know, ancestral stories and, and culture, but they're about artist's identity, you know, contemporary identity, and like, you know, Daisy Hamlet, who's got works here, you know, she's got line dancing in the textiles exhibition, and that's about Daisy going out and just loves to line dance. So, you know, there's many different stories that come out in people's textile designs. So, yeah, it's... Um... And uh, on the textiles, I'm just going to divert very quickly and talk about, um, both direct this one to both uh, Bobby and Francois, as people who have worked with, uh, artists who have worked with textiles, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an artist who I, I paint uh, abstract, and there's a reason for that, it's because I never went to art school and I never learned any patience, but <laughs> it creates a beautiful, it's very fluid, um, mistakes are few and far between, and if they, if they exist, you know, you just explain it out or no one's going to see it. But I'm wondering, as artists who create in that, as you say, will, will that design work? You don't have any control, you have control, but to a degree of how it will come out. Um, and I remember talking a couple of months ago with the uh, Wienham Art Centre and they'd sort of gone into the press themselves making um, merchandise and printing, uh, uh, you know, themselves. And they were, listening to them talk, they were so preoccupied with bleeds and, and it wasn't perfect and uh, the ink would run a little bit. Is, 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 uh, is perfection uh, of that line something that you focus on or can you, are you ever able to accept it if that's the case and, and you know, because with, with an abstract painting you just slap some more paint over it. It's a really good question to ask. Um, Bobby and I, we're kind of, um, well, I walked through the textile exhibition with, with Bobby um, last week and we were looking at um, some of the techniques used to so that if there are little kind of um, gaps, they're purposeful. So you manage that, but Bobby will speak to that. But I guess I work in digital repeats. Um, I have, where it's very important that your repeats are exact. Um, and that just takes time, it's not, it's not, I don't think of it as being a big deal, but you are getting the repeat top and bottom, side to side, so that you can place that repeat um, and it can go on anything. So that's important to have that repeat exact. Um, with digital, I also consider scaling, um, colour, um, direction, like line direction, all these kind of principles of design that make for a good aesthetic. Um, and as a designer, um, as an interior designer, I think about how repeats can be used in the built environment. Um, I think it's really important, something that Bobby touched on before, is considering the value of the artwork in that repeat because there's usually you know, really meaningful stories with, contained within that medium. And like, you know, you have these businesses out there like Marameco, like William Morris, like um, Florence Broadhurst, um, who knew the value of their designs and they didn't have it go on just anything. They put it purposefully onto um, suitable applications, so the built form um, onto, you know, some fabrics are, are great for upholstery, but some are not because the meaning in them, um, you don't really want to have someone sitting on it. <laughs> so, you know, thought goes into that, you know. Um, and even, I guess today there's, um, there is that opportunity to make products within a price range that, you know, will bring income into a business or art centre. And there also has to be consideration about around, do I devalue that artwork? Do I make the per metre sale of that artwork value less because it's being used um, on a tea towel or on something, you know, you know, less than? So it's considering there's, there's a purpose for print um, and then when you bring meaning into that 
artwork that's within that print to be considered again. Mm. I might, can I hand over to you? Um, yeah, so getting back to um, how the artwork happens and what you were saying about, um, I think why this work, the work in the um, courthouse works so well is um, screen printing can be a very tight kind of medium and very flat. Um, and, but this work isn't like that because there's just um, a wonderful looseness with the way most people work and there's not this worry about things matching up and not leaving gaps and um, no, no artists that I've worked with have been to textile school and I haven't been to textile school and I think that's sort of a good thing because we haven't learned about all these techniques and tightening up and half drops and all this ter terminology so none of that happens and it's just what happens when we're out there in that space of time and what that artist brings brings to the you know the creation of new work and so there are a lot of mismatches um, but but that means the work breathes you know there's a lightness and a, um, a joy in the work so um, but then as you were saying you know the, uh, it's time now because they've been growing so rapidly over the last even five years it's time now for the industry to really get together with the artists, you know, at, at, in their places of where they live and really work out what everybody wants and how to keep this work safe and how it can remain with art centres and in their control and not be lost to the big world, which, you know, is, is a worry with this work because it is so reproducible and everybody is, you know, loves it so much. And um, so it's how to, um, you know, for artists and art centres to manage it so it's not overloved, you know, so it goes to the right places of, you know, the fitting kind of places. So that's kind of what I would say about that. Lots of work to do in that area. Yeah, and I think it's um, a really, I think it's, we're getting into a nice space where uh, something that's been run through a print and it's on a, on a, on a uh, you know, panel of, fabric or, or, or whatever material you'd use, that you go, that is the artwork. No, I'm not going to just print another hundred of them as merch and have that valued as the way it is. With that sort of, um, that intention between what it is I'm putting on uh, and to where, uh, I want to bring it to the Mornington Island Art Centre exhibition that you have at Northside. It's, it's, the, the Mornington Island uh, art, artworks are, are famous for ver lots of colour, beautiful uh, designs. The, the space, the wall's quite dark. So what was the intention there um, behind showing them in, in a space where the colours just... I mean, they become so vivid. So that's, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable, um, what would you call it, phenomenon of lighting. Um, someone walked in and said they like jewels for the walls <laughs> and they do um, sparkle in that darkened space and it's lovely to see um, those places. I haven't been to Mornington Island but I um, think about the coloured rocks and the uh, stonefish traps and the country through those paintings. Um, so they were actually, the artists wanted to create large works and these legacy works looking at um, those senior artists who have passed and um, originally they um, wished to use the tall void space which is eight metres tall. Um, however, uh, the Jabakai work um, was felt to be more fitting in that space so they swapped around um, but it, I thought it was um, uh, uh, great that the team installed that way and it's been really lovely also to be stepping back and experiencing the exhibitions there um, while on maternity leave at arm's length, ducking in and out. Um, so I think that was really beautiful and we were hoping this week um, to have the Mornington Island artists here and um, obviously, you know, COVID's changed everything around the world and they're still hopeful that they can come and experience the works in that space or at least do um, an interaction, a painting workshop across. So. Um, but just thinking about elevating um, and textiles, I was thinking during that conversation about Fran's tropical punk backpacks and the way that she's used um, a textile, the black bean textile, and kept it for something really quite sacred and special and boutique. So the seed pod design um, came about, um, you know, I love walking on the beach and... Um, 
down in Mission Beach, you've got black bean trees growing right down on the water edge and there's a little patch of black bean forest on a particular walk just north of Mission Beach. And the seed pods are just a beautiful example of you know, nature's efficiency in design where you've got this you know, beautiful form of the pod itself and then when you open it up, there's this um, filling around the, the seed and it's just a neat encasing of that oblong seed shape and it's just so beautiful and a lot of my inspiration comes from the environment, um, comes from my country, comes from you know, heart connections, so my children's special things that have happened around them connected with that country. In this case, it was my just admiration for this beautiful seed pod. Um, and in working with Emily, she, um, when we were looking at, we had decided to design a bag of some sort and we decided to go away and then come back together with ideas on shapes and show our sketches to each other. And we both had round bags, which is, you know, that's pretty, that's amazing, I think. So her inspiration come from, came from, um, like, she's very, um, a very contemporary Scottish designer. She is, she's moved away from what's traditionally recognised as Scottish design, so she's trying to pave a new way there. And she's very influenced by punk, so, you know, there's the zips and the hard edges and that sort of thing. Um, with punk and doing away, going away from natural forms, whereas I'm all about natural forms and so you had this mashing of these two different sources of inspiration, yet it worked. <laughs> um, so that was how the, the bag developed out of, like I, I saw a circular seed pod design and then in going through that process of how do we make this work as functionally and how do you actually sew it um, and strengthen it and strengthening a round form is not easy so you know the things you investigate um, so that that seed pod design that I've called black bean design um, is special it's a very special one so that's one that just won't go anywhere um, and I really do take my leading on keeping um, prints, certain prints, really, you know, you, you, you consider where it can go because you want it to be valued. And um, so, you know, like I said before, there's great companies that have example that um, an indigenous design will do it the way that aligns with our philosophy um, and um, um, just honour honour that natural, beautiful form that you, you find in nature and put it in special places, hopefully on buildings. Mm. It's, um, it's great to hear about the way that the, the design came in, as you said, like a mashing between, uh, you know, uh, um, Scottish and, and Torres Strait Island influences and Mission Beach coming in uh, to a beautiful form. And uh, just to, on a personal note, with, with your show at Northside, I, w I think it's brilliant um, because it takes um, something that I guess would be fair to say is a, usually would live in a fashion world or in a, a you know manufacturer's world um, that practicality of, a, of of something that's been designed and as 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 you know and hearing from you today Francois. Um, nothing's done by accident in the design world, no matter what it is that's being designed. And having it showcased in an art gallery, I think, gives that concept and that background more accessibility to people um, who, you know, would otherwise go to a shop and buy it. And maybe if a work was, um, you know, uh, you know, a high brand, you know, such as Louis Vuitton or something like that, then they would have a, that appreciation for the stitching or for something, but to bring it into a, a gallery space, I think gives gives a collaboration and a beautiful in, intention behind it, a bit more of a voice. Back to Northside, and you were saying before that 
that you'd swapped over the Jabber guy and the Mornington Island uh, works in terms of the space that they appear in. How do because you're the only one here with a with a gallery with many different um, you know galleries inside. How do you look at a space when you see a proposal for an exhibition, see some works, and uh, pick I, I guess which room they'd go in? Um, I think sometimes artists are creating for those spaces. Um, sometimes it's conversations that are happening over a couple of years, and then you know, moving things around on the calendar, and I think flexibility's been the thing for anyone running galleries or working in galleries over the last two years. Um, so, but I think it's really about creating spaces and using spaces in different ways, and artists are masters of that. Um, and I think that's the beautiful thing about exhibitions and why I love it so much, because uh, between show to show, you create these different environments that the artist embodies and um, with their work can create entirely different feelings and places for people to experience. So, flexibility. <laughs> That's why, right, the, you know, um, and availability as well of works, and as you say, it's been a tumultuous couple of years for galleries. Um, but, and, and space, how things fit, how things uh, look, whether works are, I guess with, um, with a, an institution, in an application process for an exhibition, you know, like you said, they create sometimes for space. I want to talk a bit about the where's your permit space that we're in at the moment, um, because you know people think the tanks and they, they think that the space they're creating for is around tank and, and in, a, in a beautiful rainforest setting, which of course it is, but when you actually come inside and then you see that you're actually creating for very much an art space and we have lights, we have uh, the white walls, Normally the walls here tend to be somewhat traditional and uh, you came in and uh, had a whole other way to go. So, And the works have been pre-made. How did you find fitting those works into a brand new space and designing where we're, where we're in and maybe walk us through some of that floor plan? With the Where's Your Permit um, premise, it provided an opportunity to do something different in this space and we really had to because the theme of Where's Your Permit was, it's heavy and I knew that the contributions from artists would be um, very provocative. Uh, we we had um, artworks coming from Woodjil Woodjil, from Hope Vale, from Pomparau and these are places where um, avoidance um, behaviour practices still happen today. So I wanted to create a, a floor area that, um, or a, a wall plan that allowed for um, our viewers to feel, and ex exhibitors, to feel safe and welcome. So that's one of our, you know, in my, my practice in digital design, um, Andrew and I are always very conscious of when we're designing um, facilities that are for Indigenous peoples, um, what makes people feel safe and comfortable. So um, I considered the, the main entry of the exhibition um, and that from that entry um, you could have lines of sight through the exhibition space so that if you had uh, someone who was avoiding um, being in the same immediate area as their brother-in-law, then you'd get a glimpse of them through the the breaks in the the walls on casters. You, you know, you, you can get a, a glimpse through the spaces and avoid that person. Um, we've got two points of um, access in this building, so even from outside, you get a good you can see who is around, so you can manage how you move around the space to feel safe and welcome. At the entry point, I considered um, those who wanted to maybe feel psychologically, maybe we're looking for more of a cocooning feel, which I think of like oval and circular rounded forms um, providing that. I mean, you, you see that used in um, cooler mons to nurture young babies. I mean, the, you have these um, just beautiful curved forms repeated um, even in um, bombers and the vernacular of, of um, 
shelters of Indigenous peoples and uh, and also, you know, in caves where you have paintings on the walls, but you have this cocooning sense. And I wanted to allow for that in the spine wall that curves. And at the tail of that spine wall is the um, uh, uh, the artefacts around boring and hunting tools and going hunting and um, I've got the beautiful pieces by Bernard Singleton, the the um, the stones, um, the grinding stones. So there was consideration how people, what was at the beginning when people entered the space to what was at the end, visibility through the space and that feeling of security and options on where to walk so that you feel safe. Um, and I tried to break up some of the, I guess, the theming of artwork. So some of the artworks were truth telling from days living under the act. Some were um, about um, claiming I've never lost that all, that cultural authority to express my my culture through artifacts or or telling certain stories that, that, you know, not needing permission. So I tried to break up how works were um, exhibited also to, I think, give a, a break um, to the viewer. Like, you can look around and... Because there's some really heavy themes in here. Um, so it's the first time that the tanks have gone off the grid in terms of layout. Um, and... Um, Chris Dunnard was very supportive of that happening um, and bought into that, you know, why we needed to change it. And I included a yarning circle also so that we could have conversations and so people can sit down and talk about what they're seeing on the walls, um, take stock of it. It's, it's um, and I think it's a really, we keep coming back to the point of, not, you know, everything's been, th there's a thought process behind everything, even the way that the walls sit. It's not, um, it's not because it fits physically, it's because there's a, des an intention behind it. Now with the um, textile exhibition at Courthouse, um, uh, Bobby, I was wondering if you could maybe walk us through how the, how the works have been arranged in that space. Okay, so um, because we had um, participants from right across the top end, um, people often think the top end is the territory, but the top end of Australia. So we go from Broome in the west all the way across the top of the territory, across to the Cape. Um, and so um, we've laid out the room to go from east to west. So you walk in the entrance door and you start with Hope Vale. And, um, and so it, it's in groupings of communities. There were other options to do it, but we thought, well, that's probably um, what art centres would be most happy with. And, and so then you walk through the room, you next go to Yarrabah, and um, then you come back via um, um, parts of Arnhem Land, the east part of Arnhem Land and across the top, so you've got, you know, Manangrida and then you go up the Tiwi Islands and then the Daly River region and then you go across to the west to Broome, so we, we've done it that way. And then there's two other rooms. Um, the first room is Arab as you walk in, that's the first room you see. Um, and so they, that's a room in its entirety. And then you go through the main exhibition and then on the far side is um, a, room, a didactic room about the process so people could come there and see photos and have explanations about how these textiles came to be. So um, that's how we, we worked that one out. So. What I really love about the exhibition, Bobby, is how you've um, used the the height of the space um, to really show off the, the 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 cloth and the print on the cloth and tell those stories. I think that's really beautiful. That's the, the joys of this um, repeat all overness side of the screen printing on textiles medium that you know whatever space you've got you can use it to the best and so you know with the rafters at, at six meters and 
art centres, you know, more than happy to, pr to print six metre lengths. Um, yeah, it's just going to be that way. And yeah, yeah. And look, I've been involved in textile exhibitions around and it's easy for it not to look like that. It's easy for it to look a bit scrappy. So what I love about an exhibition like that and other ones we've had, I mean, I think in Cairns we've almost had like the three most in, impressive exhibitions I've seen with textiles because you're treating them, you know, as an artworks in a gallery. And I think that's really important for this work because people see the medium of cloth and cloth, you know, cloth is something to do something with, you know, it, it's almost like it's an object in transition. You know, is it going to become an artwork that ends up in a gallery in Paris or is it going to be, you know, hundreds of pairs of shorts? And that's, that's the big thing here and what's lovely about an exhibition like that is that it gives the general public the sense of weight of the work, the legacy of the work and the stories. And, um, you know, I think you want to start at that point and you know, there's a lot of work to be done about where it ends up and talking about, you know, what you were talking about earlier, Fran, is, you know, we often talk about with artists, you know, should we have our, our gallery, should you have a gallery range and then your more commercial range? Um, and maybe their decisions that are made as the artworks um, progresses. Um, so that, that's all for the future to be, you know, worked out with, with people. Just a quick one, and um, I, I'm, I don't know how relevant it would always be. To, I mean, I guess it would depend on what the work is and what it's made with and how it's intended, how long it is. As a general rule with textiles, from your, do you prefer uh, free hanging or perhaps, um, you know, hung against a wall? Or what, what would, what's your... Yeah, no, that's an easy one. Um, definitely free hanging so that there's space around it. Mounted to the floor is, is so much weightier. Um, and flat, you know, try not to have the wrinkles in it so that all of the elements of that work, all of the story that the artist has put down is obvious to everyone. So, and that's the thing where clothing comes into it and, and you see it printed on floppy, fabrics and I think well that design could be some could be anything when you don't see I mean that that's where this work comes into its own so I think you know quality fabrics heavier fabrics rather than light fabrics and you know if you if you look in the gallery some of them aren't as flat as they could be but it's the ones that sit flat I mean I also think wallpaper is an incredible medium these days and there are some beautiful design companies down south working with some of these designs on wallpaper. And that's where, you know, I mean, I think wallpaper had a bad reputation in the 60s and 70s and things, but I think it's yet to come into its own as, as a beautiful way to show off artworks. Well, I remember in the 90s, David Bowie did a, a collection of, very small collection of bespoke wallpapers. So, and he was the head of the pack, so you might, I think you might be right there. Um, the names have escaped me, but, but many really, you know, world famous artists have wallpaper ranges, so. With, um, and I'm curious, because you'd said about with the textiles exhibition, how, how expensive the works um, are coming, you know, how far afield they're coming from. And obviously in Wesley Permit, there's so many artworks. At Northside, there's so many exhibitions. Um, I'm just wondering if we can probably go around um, uh, in a row. I want to just find out how um, the participation of the artists came about, uh, the selection of some of those works. Um, how did you coordinate, for example, artworks from the East Coast all the way through to East Arnhem Land. I'd imagine with Northside you you plan for Kiev annually and we've, we've thrown a spanner in the works uh, this year and we apologise, but uh, um, when it comes to um, pre-planning with the works, sourcing them, and uh, if you could maybe give us some insights on how that all came about and perhaps 
this is not the right question to ask of curators and gallery directors, but any key works that uh, really stood out to you when, when, when the works were coming in and you were starting to see them and then were there any key works where you went, right, that's going to, my perspective is changing. I'm getting a, a light bulb moment on how I'm going to frame it uh, or present it. That work needs a certain space or certain lighting. Now, how does that affect the way the rest of the exhibition will work? Uh, when when Janina and I originally well we wrote the brief, we encouraged um, in the I guess in the mediums and the materials used for the artworks um, to draw upon um, material that was sourced in more of their close you know in, in their local area. Um, what we received was not quite that, and I, I think. Um, you have to be willing to change and just respond to how the artists, or allow the artists to go with it, I guess, to go with how they um, respond to the brief. And so we had, um, as you can see, a lot of acrylic on canvas um, and the work coming from Hope Vale, um, you could see that, that the artists had been talking about these times and then they're painting, they're painting them. And um, they had to be grouped together. They had to be exhibited together. Um, there were um, one of the other artworks that, that was received from Frida Messina were these beautifully woven um, prawn traps. And as she created her pieces, um, I mean, she, she thought about um, what her family had been through. and. So every one of those um, traps were um, representative of a, a type of control. They, of course, needed to be together. So, um, and I think of Simone Arnold's work, which was a new, this was working with ceramics, is, is new to Simone, and she's created these beautiful pieces right behind us, um, which have a really strong um, personal response to the, um, to the aftermath of the act and the effects of the map of the of the act, um, and I chatted with Simone about you know we can't separate these um, artworks for sale. They really need to be sold as as a collection. So there are things like that that you think about. Okay, not only do they need you know how they've been exhibited, but also how they're going to be sold. And I know I had this conversation with Ashley even with the tropical punk backpacks, how they would be sold. Um, and it, you know, it places more value on, on the artworks as well when you see them as being, you know, a, a collection. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of thought went into the positioning of, and, and the grouping of artworks. Um, the standout pieces to me, that, that's a really difficult, difficult. I thought that one might be a bit unfair. <laughs> If I answer it in terms of new direction of artists, so Simone working in ceramics and then her detail in the hands and the feet and just how provocative the actual ceramic pieces are, um, I think, you know, that, that's very special. Um, you have um, Alec Tapoti's new pieces, which he's using fiberglass and sand and he's mixing stains and working yeah those materials together to create something really beautiful but yet with the with the imagery that we know is Alex but it's just presented in a very different way so it's very textural and yeah it's, that's very beautiful um, I I um, yeah so I, I I think they would be the works for me that are really different in terms of practice that that I can that I can speak to but all of them are you know are really steeped in meaning and response to the theme um, yeah they're all really strong pieces of work mm. and, and actually I mean as you say um, 
your 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 more overarching your position there, and of course the curators and then the artists themselves would put a, um, I'd imagine a, a you know a plan forward to the gallery and how they wish things to be uh, presented, and I guess. In, in, in terms of where the tanks is, it's uh, a space that, you know, the, the walls are movable, they hadn't in the past, and Francois um, had come through with, you know, Chris's support, changed the way the space looks. I imagine the courthouse, if no one's ever been into it, it's a, it's an old building, so the walls are, are there, you know, there's not much you can do about it. Um, in terms of, but you can be creative in how the works are inside of the space. Um, when when um, a, a gallery receives a, uh, a a plan for display that's you know been expressly requested by the artist or or or, or, wherever, or perhaps if it's a touring show or something like that, how do you, um, as gallery staff, um, approach handling those works and? Uh, installing them in a way that um, still carries that uh, intention as laid out by the, the artists or um, as I think Francois even had mentioned about the trap um, installation here, um, how, how is the presentation and I suppose even the handling of those works um, done in such a way to keep them uh, as close to what the artist meant? Well, I think uh, as arts workers, it's important to always honour the integrity of the artist and the work itself. And obviously working with cultural objects, there are certain rules and laws around uh, what women can touch, what people um, from that community touch or shouldn't, shouldn't see. So um, we're always guided by the artist first and foremost. And I think, you know, thinking about these different spaces and exhibitions, I really see, you know, we're fortunate in Cairns, we've got these beautiful cultural facilities and just between the tanks, the courthouse and north site within Boombaja, they're very different settings and they're very different approaches to exhibitions. So Fran and Janina's exhibition was really a call out and an invitation to artists to respond to this theme and the ritual show and uh, um, the textile show at the courthouse are really like, here's the premise and this is what we want to explore and then which artists are working in that way and fit between that way into that theme. And um, the Northside exhibitions are really conversations with artists and communities and hearing those aspirations over time and just working towards what does that show look like for you and then um, how can we come together and, and realise it. And with the, uh, especially with the textiles, I guess when it comes to, um, you know, in handling instructions, also instructions on the care, um, is, is it, I'd imagine textiles, depending on the space that you present them in and, and how, I guess, open to elements or to the public, how do you keep them uh, presented and on display in the safest way? Um, and. And yeah, back to that, how did you um, source all the works from so far afield too? And, and I guess, are, are there, because even though there may all be textiles, um, are, are, were there any specific requirements for the handling of different works from the different um, cultural vicinities that they were sourced? Um, yeah, no, look, they all arrived in different ways. You know, they came folded and they came on rolls and, um, and they arrived at the gallery and they were all, you know, rolled out and measured and rolled up onto special rolls and, and stored um, and documented and photographed and that kind of thing. Um, but w yeah, we, we really just um, put a call out and invited, you know, the art centres we knew were working with the screen printed textiles and, and then just got responses and we, you know, said, well, if you can supply a dozen images, that'd be wonderful, but we pretty much everything, every image went in. We didn't really need to, you know, pick and choose what the art centres presented. We were able to take and hang, and um, some people would write back to us and say, oh, you know, because they hadn't printed them yet, what colours? We just said, look, you know, whatever, you just, whatever the artist likes that print, you choose the best colours to show off that design and we'll do our best at this end to, to show it off in the best light as well. So it was, yeah, I mean it was a huge thing with, with um, and I think we have about 60 different artists in there and um, you know several hundred metres 
350, I think, worth of you know fabric to look after. As far as the space, um, we're pretty confident that it will be safe in that space. Um, the screen print um, and the pigments are actually quite amazing. They, I've had things for 20 years and they're still not, they're barely faded. Um, the base cloth will fade before the print usually. So for that space of time, we're pretty confident. We've had textiles hanging here that, um, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but they went mouldy because they were here over the wet, you know, part of the wet season. But we were able to get it all off, and the textiles were intact. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. But we hope that we can return them to the art centres in the condition, you know, that they've given them to us. So, um, but yeah, and it was. I mean, the space spoke to us about what what we, you know, what to look for. So. The only thing we would have said to art centres is maybe not too many fluoros with the colours you're printing. <laughs> Which, but we got everything that arrived was was absolutely amazing. So everyone was quite excited about the hanging of it. Yeah. And um, yeah, um, Ashley, you did uh, briefly mention the ritual exhibition, and of course. Um, uh, at uh, um, the Cairns, it's at the Cairns Art Gallery, and it's a satellite exhibition with the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair, and, and the uh, uh, Cairns Art Gallery team. Uh, apologies for today, but it is important to mention that the ritual exhibition uh, is on the wall at CAG. I believe that um, you'll be watching. This is being filmed in August, but you'll be seeing this in November, and there will be a, a small selection of some of the works um, still kept on because obviously when you postpone an art fair, uh, institutions, calendars and book shows obviously can't always change with us. Um, and that's a really great show as well. It's a, it spans, I think, two or three floors at the moment at the gallery. Um, and that one will be available for a virtual tour as well at the end of the year, and that's how that'll be presented um, through Archive in November. I think in closing, I want to really ask you guys probably a big one, and it would be for those at home uh, watching this or for those who have seen the exhibition and perhaps have, um, you know, they've, they've read the didactics, they've read the, um, the essays. What's something that you feel that you want to, that they may not know, or that you really think is the, the message, the one key thing that you really wish that they would take away from your shows? Can't think about them. Yep. <laughs> Who's ready? <laughs> I'll attempt it, but I'm not going to try and um, pull four exhibitions into um, one thing. But I'd just say, um, if uh, you have the time, head along to the website, um, northsite.org.au, and we're filming uh, a series of interviews with the artists that we'll share with Kayef um, for November and um, some beautiful insights from them into their work. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I feel sorry for the people who couldn't come to see it in person because there's something about being in that space. I think you feel very tiny um, walking around with those um, you know, monumental works and and I'm hoping maybe we can capture it a little bit better with a video or something. There's some wonderful still shots, but um, we haven't got much time left, but I hope we can do that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful legacy, I think, for the future of this work and for artists to you know, be inspired by and be proud of. So, yeah, thank you. Are you ready? Um, such a big question for an exhibition like this. Um, so given that those listening would have read the didactic and um, listened to our interviews, um, I, would, I would say that um, being able to respond um, to a theme such as where's your permit allows artists to um, create artworks that forms part of their process processing of the past, past traumas, inherited traumas. They can share with others and talk about what happened. And we know that when you talk about things and you find that there are others who share this common experience and there's healing that's found in sharing. And um, we have all kinds of groups that do exactly that, from Alcohol Anonymous to all kinds of different groups. It brings healing to be able to express this. Not everyone will want to, and that's okay. 
Um, but for those that do, it can really aid healing. And I think for the younger generation to know the truth and to hear it from their own, whether it's their families or from other communities, to know that this was right across Australia um, helps them, I would hope, to appreciate where they are now and the opportunities that they do have to be, you know, where, where possible. It's not always the case to, to not live with the confinements in your thinking around living under a permit system, being completely free. So I think it's really important that art is used in this way as a truth-telling platform. It's not about politics, but it's about um, being able to find another way to process, another way to share, a platform to build a common experience um, to the broader Australian nation um, through the restrictions on movement. Um, and I, I will say what um, Susan Ray said earlier in a previous conversation about um, thinking about when you see um, Indigenous people in parks drinking, um, give a second thought to the circumstances of life, of generations that has affected them to be in that place. Um, think again about that before casting judgment. Mm. And it's such a great sentiment, because, and it was, it's one that was um, also echoed last night at the opening of the Where's Your Permit exhibition by um, Guju Guju, um, Seath Formal. He had mentioned in his speech, his Welcome to Country, that um, we're all here together now, but we don't have the same history. And, um, but we've, I feel that we've made a little bit of history here today uh, in bringing uh, you three lovely people together uh, to talk about your wonderful shows that are a moment in time. And come November, when you will be watching this through um, uh, the uh, digital um, Kayaf platform, um, the shows won't be on the walls. Um, we are hoping to have uh, um, a virtual display of some of the exhibitions for you to still be able to enjoy in November, of course. And, um, uh, it, you know, the insights such as these, such as the Northside um, interviews, uh, the talks today, and of course, um, as Francois mentioned, uh, a two-part um, interview that uh, her and I had done. Um, I want to say thank you for sharing uh, your insights into yourselves, your practice as arts professionals and leaders, and uh, the works that are on that you've been involved in presenting, and for joining us here at the Yarning Circle in Tank Four. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>